I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. Uh, I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Just why? I hate you. I hate you. This is out of control. So what we're going to watch first is, I, I, I'm going to give this to you guys in a weird order. We're going to first watch Jeffrey Dahmer's final statement and his sentencing. The witness impact statements happen before the verdict. These are going to be a little bit out of order, but I kind of wanted you guys to like hear Jeffrey's words first. So we're going to hear Jeffrey's words first, and then we're going to hear from the victims. And then we're going to listen to an interview that he did. And I want to know if you guys think that Jeffrey Dahmer I don't know if you guys think he's actually remorseful. If you're new here, my name is Bose. We do true crime here every Monday. We also do it throughout the week on YouTube. Make sure you follow the channel if you like true crime, human behavior, or you just want to know how to stay safe out there and where these motherfuckers are hiding at. Also, how many victims was it? Was it seven? Oh my, oh my God, it wasn't seven. It was 17. It was 17, guys. 17 fucking people. Jeffrey killed 17 fucking people. And we're not going to go over the full case today because that's so, 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 so much. But just to give you guys a little bit of a summary, he killed 17 men and young boys, mostly like targeted people that were like kind of in the closet or maybe he met people at clubs, just things like that. Um, and he targeted these boys. And it, it, honestly, a lot of his victims were black men. After some of the early murders, he started experimenting on people. He wanted to create a zombie and so with each of the murders, he tried like removing parts of the brain or like injecting acid into their brain and trying to dissolve their ability to think. It's like really, really crazy. There's a lot of details in it. I'm not going to try to go through the whole Jeffrey Kondamer case because I don't know every detail of it right now, but we can look at the court stuff. So Jeffrey's words first. So, and just so you guys have a little more context too, this is right before sentencing, right? So even though the guilty verdict has already been put out, uh, Jeffrey could be bidding to maybe get parole or less time, but I think everyone in this room knows at this point that he's going to get like the death penalty or no parole, multiple life counts. He killed 17 people. There is no chance for parole here. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. That's that's great that you have peace now, Jeffrey. That is great. Now that you've killed 17 people and just gotten it out of your system while you're trying to figure out if you're sick or evil, now it's all over. <laughs> Go to therapy. Go to therapy. My attempt to help identify the remains was the best that I could do, and that was hardly anything. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I know I will be in prison for the rest of my life. I know that I will have to turn to God to help me get through each day. I should have stayed with God. Surprise, he didn't. Somebody killed him in jail, a black guy. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. Thank God there will be no more harm that I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. I have instructed Mr. Boyle to end this matter. I do not want to contest the civil case. I have told Mr. Boyle to try and finalize them if he can. If there is ever any money, I want it to go to the victim's families. And now I, Jeffrey Dahmer, who have killed your loved ones and taken them away from you, but I have now decided that any money that comes from anything should go back to the victim's families. And each one of those people had two, three, four, five, maybe even 10 people that loved them. So the 150 of you, you're gonna have to split up all that money. But I, Jeffrey Dahmer, will be giving that money back to you because I did something really bad. Anyways, it's over now. I've talked to Mr. Boyle about other things that might help ease my conscience. I want to return to Ohio and quickly end that matter so that I can put all of this behind me. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. 
I think the trial did that. I take all the blame for what I did. I hurt many people. The judge in my earlier case tried to help me, and I refused his help, and he got hurt by what I did, causing them to lose their jobs. And I hope and pray that they can get their jobs back because I know they did their best, and I just plain fooled them. For that, I am so sorry. Mosaka refers to the policeman that got fired because they failed to help one of his victims, 14-year-old who managed to leave the flat, and they were tricked by Dahmer and brought him back to his apartment afterwards. <gasps> I did hear about that. The policeman didn't believe the 14 year old boy and they brought him back to Dahmer. Oh yeah, they had to go. Oh, they had to go. I know I hurt my probation officer who was really trying to help me. I am so sorry for that and sorry for everyone else that I have hurt. I've hurt my mother and father and stepmother. I love them all so very much. No, you don't. I hope that they will find the same peace I am looking for. He's gonna be looking for a long time. He's gonna, like, literally, even after death, he's still looking. He will never find that peace. That peace is gone. It is no longer for you. It is for all of us. We have taken the peace that you could have had if you had just gone to therapy. It's ours now. I want to publicly thank Mr. Boyle. He didn't need to take this case. But when I asked him to help me find the answers and to help others, if I could, he stayed, stayed with me and went way overboard in trying to help me. Mr. Boyle and I agreed that it was never a matter of trying to get off. It was only a matter of which place I would be housed the rest of my life, not for my comfort, but for trying to study me in the hopes of helping me and learning to help others who might have problems. I know I will be in prison. I pledge to talk to doctors who might be able to find some answers. He said, I know society will never be able to forgive me. So question for you guys, when somebody does something like this, let's say it's a modern day case, serial killer, he's killed 17 people. What would you want them to say? Personally for me, um, there's a point where I don't wanna fucking hear from you. If you do say something, sure, I'ma pull it up for entertainment purposes only, but I don't wanna hear anything from you. I'm surprised they let him talk this much. Literally, nobody wants to hear anything from you. Nobody, dude. We want to know that after you kill 17 people, you are living in a living hell every single day. <laughs> I promise I will pray each day to ask for their forgiveness when the hurt goes away, if ever. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. Your Honor, I know that you are about to sentence me. I ask for no consideration. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive an eternal life. Thank you, Your Honor, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. The court will impose the mandatory life sentence Oh, it's sentencing. Plus an additional 10 years on the habitual criminality. Count two, life imprisonment plus 10 years. Yo, I, oh man. I have never wanted to be a judge more in my life. We watch so many of these cases and this is the first time that I'm like, I wish I was sitting in that seat. I wish I was sentencing this mother right now because I bet you it felt, it felt so good to say every single one of these words. Count three, life imprisonment <laughs> with the date of parole eligibility 70 years from the inception of that particular sentence. I don't have all the numbers that I can't work it out, but it'll be 70 years from the beginning of that sentence, <laughs> which will be consecutive to count two Count four, life imprisonment with a parole eligibility to be 70 years from the commencement. Count 15, <laughs> uh, life imprisonment with parole eligibility to be 70 years after the inception of that sentence to be consecutive wow. to count 14. Now we just heard Jeffrey's words. Let's hear from the families of the victims. Now, you guys know, I, I get a little apprehensive 
playing victim impact statements because they're very, very important. They are very, very, very important because that's the uncomfortable part. That's the part you don't want to hear. That's the, oh my God, this was real and this ruined people, you know? But I really urge you guys, I think that these witness impact statements are really important. Let's take a listen. And then afterwards, we're going to listen to his stupid fucking interview. The relatives of the victims. First of all, thank God and to give thanks to the judge and to Mr. McCann for the verdict that came in. I would like to say to Jeffrey Dahmer that he don't know the pain, the hurt, the loss, and the mental state that he had put our family in. But I'd just like to read a poem that a good friend of my son wrote. Oh. Tony thought you was his friend. He knew you. Why am I a victim in your cruel and ruthless world? Although I can't communicate with a loud voice, listen to me anyway. Try to have mercy on my moans. Look at the tears roll down my face. See that each one is a cry for help. And realize, realize my sign of showing you that I want to live. But one day, I know you'll get caught. You think you're smooth at what you're doing. Remember, Call them out. whatever's done in the dark, it will come to the light. And the whole world will know just how ugly a person you really are. Mom, I'm gone. My hope, my breath, my want to live have been taken away from me unwillingly and emotionally. Two fingers and one thumb means I love you in sign language. My son was deaf. <gasps> when you cry, take one teardrop and place it outside your window ledge. And when I pass by, I'll exchange it for one of mine. Two fingers and one thumb. Mom. I don't have nothing prepared to say. It's just a few things that I would like to say. You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I loved him the last time I saw him, which will be a year tomorrow. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. She'll never have a chance to sing and dance with him again. Mm. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I'm a J.W. Smith, uh, brother of Edward Warren Smith. Mr. Dahmer. Oh, he said Eddie's gone. Mr. Dahmer. The victim of your senseless killing. Where do we go from here? We ask ourselves. Why did this happen to a person like Eddie? He gave so much and asked so little. All he wanted was a chance to be himself. A chance to be happy. When all the facts are known, we hope that society will have gained some knowledge that will help prevent a tragedy such as the one Eddie suffered. There was no sacrifice too large or too small for Eddie. He truly loved giving and gave of himself abundantly. Edward Warren Smith tried to be Jeffrey Dahmer's friend. As a result, he lost his life. The other thing is to like, I, I try not, I don't, I don't like to make a lot of things on my stream like race related because they can get out of control very, very quickly. But one thing that I do really want to point out here is that he preyed on um, like, he preyed on a lot of gay black men. And this all happened in, what was it, the 80s, guys? Between 78 and 91. Even now, it is incredibly difficult to be LGBTQ and be in the black community. It's very hard. I didn't come out as bisexual until I was 28 years old. And so these men that were coming out, these black men that were coming out in the 80s and just being honest, being who they were, out at clubs, doing all this stuff, these people were just... 100% being themselves in a demographic, black families where it wasn't really okay, and during an era where it wasn't okay. These people were so strong, and then he just cut them down. I cannot imagine how much knowledge could be bestowed from these 17 people if they were still alive and they lived through this kind of lifestyle like in the 80s. My name is Inez Thomas, and I'm the mother of David Thomas. You know, I don't understand how a person could really harm a person and to say that well I did this because he wasn't my type but if everybody go around doing something to somebody because it's their, their type this would be a sad world today good morning honor my name is Donald Bradoff on the for the Bradoff family oh. as much as love in our family close my mother gave five beautiful kids we lost he destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. Yes. I love that he turned to him and looked right at Jeffrey when he said, and I hope you go to hell. 
Yes. You guys did a wonderful job. Bottom of my heart, thank to God, I'm, I got a lot of strength. Thank you all. God bless America. I love him. I don't know why. I love him. I know that was so. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, say. Ah! I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey! Oh, I hate you, motherfucker! I hate you! That is out of control! Oh my don't God. fuck with me, Jeffrey. I'll kill you, God damn it. Look at me. Oh. Okay, honestly, talk your shit. Y'all notice how the guards came up on her real slow because they knew, they knew, they were like, say it, girl, say it, get it all out, get it out, we gotta take you out of here, but just get it all out, yes, That would be me, that would be me. Honestly, listening to his sentencing first and seeing how he took the case and how he allowed it to affect him, all culminating up into this response. Now, let's watch this piece of shit's interview because I don't know about y'all, the question for tonight was, is... Jeffrey Dahmer actually remorseful? So far, I, I feel like he isn't, but you know. We met with him at the maximum security prison where he is serving his sentence of 999 years. For the first time, he I, I talks any, about his anyway. crimes and gives us a chilling look inside the mind of a serial killer. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. But when you hear him, that's another story. I desensitize myself to it. I. I... I, uh, I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them. Right. Okay, night. I'm just, okay, I'm just gonna say it. Like, okay, so th there's a huge racial component of this, but it could be a lot of different things. He could have targeted gay black men because maybe he was more sexually attracted to them, and that's why he tried to make a zombie, because he was trying to make a sex zombie, a mindless sex zombie. That's very, very plausible. Or, two, what he just said, I wanted to own them. I wanted to possess them. Well, maybe he's a little more conditioned to think that he should own black men. Or, three, maybe he really did hate that. I have no idea, but there is there is a racial component to this, but we don't know the truth of how Jeffrey was programmed or what he actually thinks. Any parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer is recalling his monstrous past. Jeffrey Dahmer, an unassuming chocolate factory worker, would eventually confess that he had seduced, murdered, and dismembered 17 young men. He even ate some of his victims' body parts. When you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being, uh, it, it seems to make it easier <laughs> to uh, do things you shouldn't do. Jeffrey Dahmer is intelligent and articulate. That is what makes him so frightening. This is what I hate. These media reports where we're just complimenting inside the mind of a serial killer. Jeffrey Dahmer is intelligent. Actually... Just because somebody is well-spoken doesn't mean that they're intelligent. Because if you kill 17 people, I think you're one of the dumbest f***ing people on this planet. Like, there's no way that you're going to give the word intelligent and combine that with murderer, killer, anything of that nature. And then second of all, calling him frightening? This guy isn't scary. He preyed on innocent people. He preyed on people. I'm sorry, he preyed on gay black men that thought that they were like, oh, here's a tall white guy that's interested in me. I feel validated. I'm excited. I'm going to have a fun night tonight. This man is not frightening. Why are we calling him that for clicks? He's a bitch. I hate this stuff. You do sound, though, like the kind of person who could have said to himself, this is wrong, I must stop. You do seem like the kind of person that could have said that to yourself. So it's like, you seem like you're just like all the rest of us. And that's how dumb we are as society, that someone can somewhat look like us and be as well-spoken as us, and then somehow we put them in the same category as, us, as, as each other. We look at somebody that looks like us and talks like us, and we think like, oh, what? They could never, they couldn't kill anybody. They, what? Uh, after the, the first 
Oh, is Doc the here? Hi, Doc. The first killing was not planned. I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over. Get help! Get help! <laughs> the hitchhiker's name was Stephen Hicks. He was just 18. Jeffrey Dahmer took him to his parents' house. There, he strangled him with a barbell. He dismembered the body and hid it in a drain pipe. One time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel. <laughs> I was like, oh. Uh, I was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I was heavily bruised. Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory I of it? I have no memory of it. It was, a, it was almost addictive. It was almost uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. But Jeffrey Dahmer was out of control. The urge to kill had overpowered him. As police later learned, he wasn't satisfied with his victim's death. He wanted more. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance. I don't even think I'm ever going to cover Jeffrey Dahmer again. Like, he's just a piece of shit. <laughs> you should have got help. You're emotionally disturbed and nobody cares about you. 